So I read the curmudgeon's guide to getting ahead when it came out. Uh, and I found it very uh, frank, very straightforward, uh, very, very good advice. Um, and in it, you talk a bit about your working habits. Um, what is it that has led you to such consistent productivity? What do you think are your most important work habits? Well, I can tell you what they are uh, first and then maybe evaluate them a little bit. I found that I can write first draft for only about three or four hours max. And I also am a morning person. And so my productive first draft writing is from about seven o'clock in the morning to about 11. And at that point, I'll be writing a paragraph and I'll be stuck and I'll say to myself, you know what, this is going to be a lot easier tomorrow morning. And I will stop doing first draft and then I can spend the rest of the day. I can edit second draft, third draft. I can do that all day. I can do data analysis all day. I love to do data analysis. And so I'm basically six days a week. Um, well, not that no longer I used to be for years. I was basically working. I would be at my desk by 630 and I would leave my desk about 630 at night. Now I would, I would uh, intersperse that with uh, online chess. Uh, I would, uh, when there was still online poker, I would uh, intersperse it with uh, uh, an hour of, uh, of online poker. But I don't see how you can mix online poker with data <laughs> analysis. That seems completely impossible. I'm not doing the data analysis while I'm doing the online. No, when I'm doing the online poker, that's all I'm doing. But for my work style, I've noticed certain things that are that are not conducive with intellectual activity. So in physical activity, there are certain rules like you can't swim and then play tennis. You'll, you won't be able to function. You can't you can't lift weights and then go play tennis. Uh, you can't uh, swim and expect to hit a golf ball. Like there are certain things that just don't mix. And for me, uh, I love to play tennis. So I, I find that it works great to play tennis in the evening. Playing tennis in the morning jumbles my mind in a way where I find it tough to be at, at peak productivity. Playing poker, uh, I find it's hard to do to do much after playing poker. You can do all you want before playing poker, and it won't won't necessarily uh, impact the way you play, even if you have a full day and then go play poker. Um, I don't find so much difference if I have nothing going on and then go play poker versus having a lot going on and then go play poker. But, but playing poker and then doing something else, I find quite, quite difficult. Well, you know what? That may explain why you make so much more money at poker than I do, that uh, you are bringing a lot more to the game and a lot more intellectual energy, you are probably much more exhausted after a session of poker than I am because I don't have the ability to bring to the game what you have the ability to bring to it. So for me, it could serve as a diversion. Uh, but in part, it could only serve that as, as a diversion <laughs> because I'm not that good at it, if you see what I mean. So you would play poker from like 3 to 4 p.m. and then keep working from 4 to 6.30? Yeah. Now, uh, at this point, though, I would be, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't have the sense of being exhausted after an hour of poker. It was, uh, yeah, I, I've never had that problem. But again, you know, if you do something really well, one of the reasons you're doing it well is because you have talent at it. 
And if you have talent at it, you are bringing much more to that activity than somebody who doesn't have as much talent. And uh, yeah, I can imagine that you are completely wiped out uh, in terms of doing anything else by playing poker because you're so much better at it. <laughs> and I get pretty wiped out by writing first draft. There are lots of people that can write stuff for more than three or four hours and not feel exhausted, but I would argue the people who can do that probably aren't bringing as much intensity to the effort as I am. Now, the reading part of things, the research part of things, do you keep that as a completely separate phase or are you doing that at the end of the day as well? It depends on the topic. I did a book called Human Accomplishment, uh, not one of my better known books, but I think it's one of my more interesting ones. Back in 2003, it was published. And, and to do that, I had to spend basically two years doing nothing but collecting data because I was gathering stuff on um, historiometric measures I won't go into, but I couldn't do the analysis and do writing in tandem. So it was two years of data analysis before I put pen to paper or before I started typing on my keyboard. But in most books, that's not the case. So that when I was writing hum, uh, Human Diversity, and let's say I was, I was working on the uh, section on sex differences, and so I would, at the time I did the chapter that used the data from the Duke program with highly gifted students, I was reading all the technical articles on that and then writing up draft on that. And then when I moved on to uh, the, uh, the neuroscience, I would, I would read that material and I'd write up that material. So, so in, in those cases, it's, uh, it's not a sequential process, it's a, an interactive one. And, and it's even with something like human accomplishment, after I got started writing, there was still interaction. I think that one of the most important things that people who do my kind of work should realize is that the process of writing is also a source of your creative function. Um, I mean, the, 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 there are so many times that I will be writing a paragraph and in the course of writing the paragraph, I have, I have posed a question that I hadn't thought of before. And that leads me to go back and try to answer that question I hadn't thought of, which then changes the draft. And other people aren't that way. Um, there was a famous uh, social scientist named James Q. Wilson, who a uh, brilliant guy, and he would do the research and he could pretty much write a first draft that was publishable. Not very many people can do that. I think my way of doing it is much more common. The process of writing suggests to you new ways of thinking that hadn't occurred to you. And that's in, in turn makes the book better, makes the writing better. Just one other comment about work habits. Um, first place, I've found, because I've read some books on other pe uh, people's work habits, among writers, I'm pretty typical. Uh, most writers say three hours, four hours of uh, first draft is all they can do. And the other thing that everybody agrees on, you do not, you do not wait for inspiration. <laughs> you don't wait until the muse has uh, hit you. You sit down in front of your computer at uh, the same time every day and you just do it, uh, even if you don't feel inspired. Now, the 12 hours a day, that, that part, 12 hours a day, six, hour, six days a week, that's a tough schedule. I don't think many writers are keeping that schedule. I think that most people who... This is another characteristic of people who accomplish things. And this sounds fatuous because I'm putting myself in that group, but, but I'm saying now as a social scientist, having studied what, what uh, people who have great achievement have in common, the one common denominator is they work their asses off. Uh, they, they working long, long hours is a hallmark of whether it's great musicians, great composers, great, writers, great scientists, um, 12 hours a day, six days a week is probably the norm among the people who 
who are at the higher levels of uh, productivity. And it's not, you know, by the way, I don't want to exaggerate. I'm, I'm at my computer uh, for about 12 hours, or I was when I was somewhat younger. Younger, I'm not working all that time. I am interspersing with the stuff. But hard work is, well, how many hours do you put in? Would you consider all the study and all the analysis? And... Yeah, I, I think I, I think I'm a hard worker. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a worker. Uh, I don't think I can do 12 hours most days. Um, but yeah, I consider myself uh, quite a hard worker, generally speaking. I think it's interesting with regard to reading and writing, which fair to say that's your life work. Yeah. Um, I would imagine that it's in some ways a depressing time because the societal attention span has shifted away from reading in a way that uh, I'm sure it was not always great to read the reviews of the, the bell curve when it was coming out, but you knew it was being read widely and getting a splash. Whereas I could feel your disappointment when you said that human diversity was not being read. And I think for authors generally, there's an issue now where the societal attention span has gone away from reading as a core activity. And uh, it's, I don't know where that leaves us, and it actually hasn't necessarily found its way to book sales. People are still buying books, but the, the world has moved away from reading as a central activity. Um, I'm wondering, first of all, do you see that in your just observations about publishing in the media landscape? Do you see it? And then second of all, how do you guard against it yourself how do you maintain a long attention span to make sure that you're uh consuming quality works and writing quality works yourself first have i observed that yeah and i, I sometimes wonder if if i'm the last in the last generation of social scientists who can have a career that consists mostly of writing books um because it doesn't seem to me that given the, the problems with short attention span that you're talking about, it just seems to me that my time has passed, that that, that, kind, of, that kind of way of spending your career has passed. That does depress me um, because I think that, well, I think two things. First, I think there are an awful lot of books that are published that are really should be long magazine articles. You know, I think a lot of people pad stuff and, and the, the book isn't worth going all the way through. But I also think that the best of the social science books are ones where you need a book to, to make the key points. The second question, second part of your question about uh, how do I make sure that I'm not also <laughs> victim of the short attention span? Most of the stuff I read are journal, journal articles. Uh, because you know, take the case of human diversity. That field is moving so rapidly that by the time a book comes out, it is already to some degree outdated. And, and even in the case of human diversity, which has only been out for a couple of months, there are interesting things that have been found since I stopped uh, being able to change the text of human diversity. And it was, so when I was writing the book, I wanted to be up to speed with the very latest things, and that means journal articles. And actually, the, in this regard, there's been an improvement uh, recently because now you have preprints of journal articles that are appearing, published online, so you don't have to wait through this the agonizing process uh, between the time that the basic work is done in an article and the time it appears in a published journal. But reading journal articles, it's a matter there, too, of, of uh, what are you using it for. A journal article consists of a methods section, and it consists of a data analysis section, and then a dis uh, conclusions and discussion. And so for some journal articles, uh, 
I don't need much more than the bottom line of conclusions. I need to look back to have a sense of whether I can trust the conclusions or not, look back to the methods. I do not have to spend hours going over the methods section to make sure they dotted every I and crossed every T. So I can be selective in that regard. And when, I, when, I'm, when I'm reading for purposes of writing a book, I am very specifically focused on that topic. And I, I don't have a problem with getting distracted in that regard. So there's an efficiency aspect of reading journal articles. You feel like it's the best way for you to get up-to-date information. Uh, are, you, are you also saying that there's a, a no-sugar diet aspect to it where it's, it's like uh, you could be reading tweets from people that are bringing interesting things to your attention, but uh, you'd rather just keep it pure with the, with the journal articles and you could oh. be reading interesting narrative that might help color the discussion, but you don't, you don't want to do that. You just sort of. No, actually I use Twitter as a research tool so that if you go to my uh, follower list on Twitter, <laughs> you will find a, a number of poker players and, but you will also find a lot of geneticists and neuroscientists. And the reason I follow them is that they will link to the newest work in their field. And so I, uh, I, your, Twitter is a great research uh, tool for finding out what specialists in different fields are considered to be the cutting edge stuff that's coming out. So yeah, I do, there, there, is, there is some sugar in my diet in that regard. Uh, there is very little pondering over, over an article. I mean, sometimes it will, the stuff in an article will have intrigued me enough that I spend a lot of time thinking about it, but I'm pretty efficient in trying to extract meat of what's gone into it and moving on. Your pessimism about the ability of social scientists in the future to make a career writing books by the way, I'm also pessimistic on that. I, I, I think, I think shockingly, uh, even the best-selling nonfiction authors of the day are pessimistic on that. If you think, uh, it seems like a Gladwell spends maybe more time on the podcast than writing the next book, <laughs> because I, I, I do think there's a certain degree of pessimism. Well, People are listening to podcasts, but they're not reading books. Um, so it's a crazy aspect of the time we live in that maybe reading just downshifts year by year. I have a, I have a very strong sense of that. And I've, I've, well, I don't have anything original to say about this, but I am struck to the extent that I and caught up in the ability to entertain myself 24-7 uh, without stopping to think about things. That I'm like everybody else. If I'm sitting at a stoplight in my car, I'm either listening to a, a book on, on Audible or I am checking my emails or, or whatever. And the amount of time I spend just... Well, I'm, I'm sitting in a house in Jacksonville, uh, a beach house, and right out in front of me is the ocean. And I was out walking this morning along the beach, and I had to stop listening to my audi audible book, which, by the way, was a Joseph Wambaugh thriller, um, because the wind was so noisy that I couldn't hear. And as I would continue my walk, not listening to audible, but just being in this beautiful place, I said, damn it, Charles, <laughs> why do you constantly have to be engaged in, in this multitasking world? Why can't you just be alone with your thoughts? It doesn't happen to us very often anymore, and I think it's very unhealthy. Maybe your attention span today is protected by all of the long library years of your early <laughs> career. And if you had those distractions available when you were an undergrad, maybe 
there were no books in your future. It was a bit, would have been a disaster if I'd had all of these things uh, available to me. Yeah. Um, so I also wanted to ask you about the literature on cognitive aging, because uh, I've explored it a little bit. I find that area interesting that uh, you write about intelligence differences by all sorts of background, sex, race, class, what, what have you, but there's also differences within the same individual that occur uh, with age. I find that quite a fascinating topic. Um, I'm wondering- Me too. <laughs> At 77, I find that a very fascinating topic. Uh, yeah, it's a little depressing because the, 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 uh, the knowledge about it is pretty solid. Uh, there's a thing called crystallized intelligence and a thing called fluid intelligence, and they are pretty much what they sound like. Fluid intelligence involves creativity. It involves synthesizing new things, uh, doing things from scratch. Crystallized intelligence is grounded in accumulated knowledge. And the good news is that people my age have a lot of crystallized intelligence. The bad news is our fluid intelligence is, has diminished. And so um, I am conscious, I'm in pretty good shape for 77 years old, you know, but I am conscious that I can't do things intellectually I could do 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, I read a book like, uh, well, The Bell Curve to some extent, although oddly enough, The Bell Curve was not a particularly tough book. I've written books that are much tougher than that. And, uh, and I read some of the things that I wrote uh, in the 1980s, and I say, I don't think I could do that again if I were starting from scratch. And the other thing, Brandon, is memory. I mean, all the cliches about uh, your memory going, you can't recall names, you can't recall, that's all true. It's, uh, and this is, not a, this is not necessarily the onset of dementia, knock on wood, uh, it's, it's much more common than that, but it does create problems when you're trying to do what I do, which is that uh, if I read a journal article in February uh, when I was working on human diversity, I'd better write up what's in that journal article pretty soon after I've read it, because if I don't, by October, I will have forgotten what that journal, uh, journal article exists. And so, it's simply, it's simply a statement of fact that uh, the cognitive ability diminishes with age, with virtually everybody. And it is, um, if you've lived by your mind, as you do, as I have, but not by your hands, um, it's kind of depressing. So far, so good. Uh, but uh, in terms of I can still function, but... Uh, it's, imagine what it'd be like to be an athlete, though. It's much worse with athletes. Because they, they basically athletes, for the most part, are past their prime in their mid to late 30s. So it's a lot better to have a prime that is declining in your 70s than in your 30s, I guess. Yeah, no doubt. And I also think that what we were talking about earlier with declining attention spans, it interplays somewhat with cognitive aging because many people as they get older they have the experience that many more things are vying for their attention so they're having a lower attention span at the same time that they're having uh, decreased ability what, one thing that's fascinating about the literature is that um, if you're if you're plotting say someone's iq at age 20 which might be the peak uh, then you're able to say well, if they have the experience of a typical person with their IQ at age 20, they will, they will experience the following changes in IQ over time, raw IQ. Um, and I find it fascinating that the, the bands of expectation is quite tight. In other words, intuitively, we would think that the, the person that had a very healthy lifestyle, that exercised several times a day, that 
didn't smoke cigarettes or have much alcohol, that kept engaged intellectually, uh, slept well, that they would have a, a much different experience with regard to cognitive aging than the, than the general population. But that, that appears not to be true. Uh, people travel along a similar path, uh, which I find somewhat strange. There are differences. I mean, there is such a thing as a healthier lifestyle, and uh, it can it can alter the trajectory at the margins. But and obviously, something like uh, severe alcohol abuse can do more than that. But but uh, but a healthy lifestyle can help you somewhat, but it doesn't dramatically change things. Let me just throw in something. Uh, you are what late thirties? I'm forty. Forty one. Okay. I've got good news for you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, a, a magical supplement? Uh, that this is, uh, you are heading into the most productive decade of your life. This is another thing which is really interesting in the literature on great achievement. Now, if you're a pure mathematician, I've got bad news for you, which is it's been all downhill since 26. But, uh, but if you're short of a pure mathematician, uh, if you are a composer or a writer, novelist, or a scientist, or the rest of it, at, at age 40, you've done two things. Uh, you've taken your initial cognitive resources, you've augmented them with experience and, and improved judgment, and in your 40s, you are sort of at the golden point where everything's, uh, you have enough experience to deepen and broaden your insights, but your intellectual abilities are close to their peak. So um, when they used to say life begins at 40, to some degree that's true. You are in the very tippy tippy top of the prime of your life for the next 10 years. Yeah, um, I've, I've heard those arguments before that, that the uh, trade off of accumulated knowledge versus raw talent is such that in your 40s, the raw talent is falling off at a very slow rate, but you've accumulated knowledge and, and the, the two effects sort of work together to peak in the 40s. But yeah, yeah. by the same token, uh, the evidence that's marshaled in support of that is often the fact that, for instance, in academics, you have your raw talent disciplines like math where people are peaking in their 20s, and then you have the uh, disciplines like economics that are some part accumulated knowledge and some part talent where people are peaking in their 40s, and then you have disciplines like history that might be weighted more towards accumulated knowledge and people there are peaking at 60. Um, but I find that evidence difficult to interpret because the achievement, say for an economist, is naturally going to be a function of the following that he's found up to that point, the prestige that he has as a uh, as a part of his position, um, the <clears throat> audience that he has, uh, and so uh, what we think of as the the, the achievements might be. Uh, determined by stuff that he's done earlier in, in his career. And I, I, I wonder, I, I wonder, I wonder about that. I wonder if maybe everyone is speaking at, at a younger age. And in, the last time you were on, you couldn't talk about your recent book because you had promised for one, you had promised an exclusive to a podcast and two, I hadn't read it yet. Um, so um how has how has the experience been of this book coming out? How how much uh, how much media have you done around the book? Uh, what has the reception been? Been the most mysterious rollout of a book I've ever experienced. I mean, I first did Losing Ground in 1984, so we're talking you know, 36 years ago, and every major book I've done since then has been reviewed by the New York Times. Sunday Book Review has been by the Wall Street Journal, by the Washington Post Sunday Book Review, the New Yorker has reviewed most of them. None of those outlets have reviewed this book. First time that's ever happened to me. It's not that the book is without interest. I mean, it's about biology of gender, race, and class, which is a pretty controversial topic. So there have been no reviews. The only review 
really in a major media has been in the Daily New York Times. And it was written by their literary critic whose education consists of a master's in fine arts. And without dissing masters of fine arts, this is a book about neuroscience and genetics and quantitative methods and social science. And not surprisingly, the review, review was not real terrific. So short answer is I've done very little media. Uh, the media are scared of the book, I think. I'm hoping that we'll get some major reviews out. I'll have some major reviews in technical journals that I know are coming out, one of which is wonderful. Um, but I doubt if any of your listeners have heard of it because it's gotten so very little attention so far. Life is mysterious sometimes. So your instinct is that the terrain is is too difficult and too risky to to tackle? Well, there's one there's one benign answer uh, as to why it's been ignored, and that is getting a reviewer to review the book who's competent in all the areas is going to be tough because one of the sections is on sex differences, uh, one is on uh, differences among different uh, ancestral populations, races, and the third involves uh, the literature on the heritability of various traits. Each of those literatures is quite separate. And so you could have lots of people who could review the section on sex differences, lots of people who could review the section on race differences, etc. Not very many people are well read into the literature of all three of those things. So, so getting a reviewer is not a simple thing. That's the benign explanation. You've got to understand, Brandon, people are scared stiff of this stuff. I mean, look at what happened to the guy named DeMore out of Google when he wrote a completely innocuous memo about some very well-established facts regarding gender differences and in uh, preferences and traits and so forth, and made some statistical statements that were just fine. He got fired. And uh, there was a great brouhaha about that. And this was with really innocuous stuff. So I think that, I think a lot of people just wish these issues would go away. They won't, but they wish they would. Yeah, I was uh, at Harvard during the summer's uh, controversies, and I, I remember quite well uh, the, uh, I thought what he said was very ill-advised, but uh, he's the type that just says ill-advised things from time to time. Um, it definitely, contributed very much to his downfall. Uh, there was, um, well, there was at the same time a damaging uh, article in Institutional Investor that came out and what, what happened, this is secondhand, but what happened was, uh, some people who were offended by what he said circulated that article as widely as possible and uh, sort of had a little PR campaign going. Uh, and it was ultimately uh, successful. But the before we get into what what he said and the, the biology, I do, I, I do think it's interesting um, <clears throat> to think about why it's it's uh, such difficult ground. Um, I can recall, I was, at, I was at the London School of Economics and a real uh, intro to me was I, was I was dating a Danish girl, seriously. And I uh, grew up in New Orleans, Pensacola and South Florida, born in New Orleans, but we were sort of moving all around. Um, so like the South, New Orleans and Florida. And did undergrad at University of Florida. Um, and when I went to London School of Economics, London School of Economics was, I would not, I would not say an especially uh, PC environment or, um, it was actually one of the best intellectual atmospheres I've ever been around. Very, uh, very free thinking and 
open conversations with people from all over the world. Um, but the girl that I was dating, she, she was from Denmark and I had never experienced quite the, I don't know how to describe it, but her view on things with regard to, to uh, with regard to, let's say, talent, talent was, was that, that everyone, everyone had exactly equal talent and it was, everything was a function of schooling and things. And it was so obviously absurd, but yet I couldn't argue any points with her. Um, and I found, I found that very disconcerting and uncomfortable, but also to be honest, I find a deep dive into the subjects a little uncomfortable as well. So it's sort of, it's, it's just, it's tough ground. Um, so I, I used to have some interesting conversations with, with my, with my ex because she was, she also happened to be in a field that was uh, deeply penetrated by the kind of the kind of thought that you are fighting against us with your work. It, she was an anthropology major, and oh, an yeah. anthropology major at LSE. Uh, uh, so uh, it was some of our conversations could be could be tough going give your readers a sense of what i'm really saying in the book about the nature of these differences for one thing i they're, they're really nothing to be scared of all right because we're talking about the biology of these differences but i'm not saying oh we are going to discover that there are biological differences we never imagined existed no you have the phenotype the, the thing we observe in people, and that is partly the result of the environment, and it's partly a result of biology. It's not entirely the result of biology in most cases. So whatever we discover is not going to surprise us about the way that men and women are different or different ethnic populations are different. But people do have to come to terms with the fact that biology plays an important role. And the science has progressed, and that, that's what your girlfriend, the, the Danish woman, does not want to accept. She wants to believe that it's all environment, and if we only get the social institutions right, and opportunities correct, and so forth, and education, then these differences will at least diminish very markedly. And that's just not true. And we've reached a point in the, in the science on this, where there are a variety of things which the experts really don't argue about that much anymore. There's, there's very solid evidence and there's a pretty strong consensus. So in the book, what I'm trying to do is to, is to talk to people like your Danish girlfriend. And I'm trying to say to them, calm down. Uh, this is not scary. We're not talking about superior sex and inferior sexes and, and superior and inferior ethnic groups. We're talking about differences that have some biological faces. So calm down, point number one. But point number two, stop trying to say that it's all the environment. That is simply like saying the earth is flat. It's not true, and you shouldn't base a society or a culture or an academic culture especially on things that are palpably, demonstrably untrue. Another reason I think people might be uncomfortable is that at a time when the social sciences have gravitated towards less and less real world data, you have always had a keen interest in data and the world as it actually is. So I feel like um, you are more of the social scientist of the of 30, 40 years ago, where the, the orientation was very real world and, and, and data and the academy has moved away from that. Um, so it's, I sense a little bit of conflict there. Do you yeah. think that's, do you think that's fair? In, in one sense, Brandon, it's more quantitative than ever. So that you pick up a sociology journal and 40 years ago, a sociology journal was a collection of essays, descriptive essays. 
and you pick up the American Sociological Review or the other major technical journals, and now they're filled with equations and graphs and so forth. But the the topics on which they focus, um, a lot of them are really trivial and unimportant. I mean, the the idea of spending a year or two on a technical article on some of the topics they choose just fills me with terror. It would be so boring and so unimportant. And meanwhile, they neglect a whole lot of topics on which there is a whole lot of data uh, because those are the ones involving human differences and biology. So on the one hand, you have a very quantitative uh, atmosphere in a lot of the social sciences, anthropology excluded, I should say. Uh, but lots of quantitative uh, work in psychology and sociology and political science and economics. On the other hand, you have a self-censorship of what they're willing to explore, which has led to, a, I think, a deep form of corruption in the social sciences. Now, getting into the, the recent book a little bit, um, for background, I have uh, an eight-year-old girl and a six-year-old boy, so I have some experience in the parenting process and in uh, observing what I can change and can't change. Uh, And so, and so um, I think what has been well established is some of the early evidence that that you marshal about uh, heritability and the fact that genes are much more powerful than the environment and that parenting choices are thought to have more effect than they actually do. And the likelihood that you're changing the uh, trajectory of your, of your kids in, in very important ways is, is small. And I, I, I thought there was some interesting data that I hadn't seen before on, for instance, um, the probability of something going terribly wrong, like, uh, depression or manic depression, schizophrenia, addiction, those, those things, which one might think are closely related to parenting choices, uh, in fact, are, are very strongly hereditary. Yeah. And, and so just so you're, uh, those who are watching us, uh, listening to us, who are, have not read into this, by the way, the name of the book is Human Diversity. And, uh, and so I, everything we're talking about here is discussed at great length in the book. But real quickly, the way that we know that counterintuitive finding that parenting doesn't make as much difference as uh, we thought is mostly twin studies. I don't mean twins raised apart, which are, they're, they're very sexy, you know, born at birth, identical twins raised apart. Those, those are interesting, but they have very small samples and the real power in understanding the different roles of the environment and genes um, with traits like depression, delinquency, educational attainment, is uh, to compare identical twins with fraternal twins. Because fraternal twins share 50% of their genes, identical twins share 100% of their genes. So if you have a correlation among identical twins for depression, which is, let's say, 0.8, and you have a correlation among fraternal twins, uh, which uh, is 0.5, really the only explanation for the difference in those correlations is genes, the different genetic heritage they share. And out of that basic algebra, you can do a lot to disentangle heritability and environment. And and Brandon, the, the thing that we parents exaggerate is, look, we have our children who turn out to be generous, let's say. Uh, They're very generous with other kids. They don't get in fights and so forth. Well, you look at your your spouse uh, and who happens to be a very generous person. Let's say you give your spouse a lot of credit for raising the child to be generous. Yeah, but there's a genetic origin to gen- generosity that your spouse passed a- along as well. And, and, uh, and like most parents, I would like to think I make a big difference in the way I did my parent. You're also able to take measurable traits, uh, 
it's well known that you focused a lot on intelligence and IQ in your work. So you, you take uh, a trait that can be measured with some noise like IQ. And in some cases you have data about the parent's IQ and also the child's IQ. And you can, you can get a quantitative relationship between the parent's IQ and the child's IQ for something like intelligence that has multiple genes determining it and is probably quite complex. So um, if I recall, you say uh, that you can roughly predict the child's IQ by, or, or you can predict the, the expected IQ of the child by taking the average of the mom and the dad and then traveling one third of the way back to the mean. Does that sound familiar? No, that's, that's uh, you're, you're talking about regression to the mean, which is uh, a technical phenomenon. It's actually statistical, uh, which is putting it very roughly. When you have an extreme level of some activity, uh, there tends to be, that tends to be abnormal. So that if you have some poker, if you, if you are running really well, you're probably going to regress to your your average level over time. the The heritability of IQ has been intensively studied. It's somewhere between fifty and sixty percent of the variance in a population. But that would say, oh well, forty percent then, or fifty percent is environmental, and that's a lot. And here's another thing that's in the book that has been studied extensively, replicated, re-replicated. And that is, yeah, the environment explains 40 or 50 percent of the variance, but most of that environmental influence is what's called non-shared, which is to say it doesn't have anything to do with the shared uh, economic environment the children have, the shared uh, parenting practices that they've experienced, the, the shared schools they've experienced. It's a much more opaque, hard to define, very hard or impossible to control set of general environmental influences. So when you say that uh, you know, 40 or 50% of the variance that could be explained by the environment, that doesn't mean you can twiddle with it, doesn't mean you can tweak it by the right policies. With regard to the expected IQ of the child being uh, predictable, it is regression to the mean, but you you have been able to estimate the parameters based on, and it's roughly, you travel one third of the way back to the mean from the, the mean of the IQ of the mom and the dad. I don't want to get it. I don't want to get too deep in the statistics. Okay. Here, but I, I, I recall seeing, the seeing that and I'm thinking that that. Um, and so presumably you could get uh data on other traits that that also have multiple origins oh, yeah. uh, but the and when you say <laughs> environment is 40 40 to 50 percent of the variance the um the context is for for every for everyone the like your yeah. because it let's say if my child is their expected IQ is a mean of uh, my ex and myself and uh, then travel 30% of the way back to the mean. Um, there's a lot of variance around that. And you're saying in terms of the explanation of variance that Brandon, we've got to be clear when I'm talking about variance okay. because uh, we're not talking about an individual when we talk about variance. We're saying if you have a population of people, you have a whole lot of variance in their IQs. And so when we talk about explaining the variance, we're, we're talking about explaining the variance in the population. And the amount of variance you're going to explain depends on the specific population and the specific time. For example, uh, if you have a school system like we had in the 19th century in which uh, in rural areas there are no high schools and, uh, and in urban areas there are, 
you're going to have very different heritability of educational attainment in an environment where educational, advanced education is easily available versus an environment where it's not available. And that's true of almost all traits. There is no such thing as an ironclad estimate of the variance that can be explained for any trait. It's always relative to a specific population. However, having said that, I should talk about what to me is the most exciting aspect of what's going on with genetics. Forget about predicting your child's IQ on the basis of uh, you and your wife's uh, measured IQ. If you, if you take the genotype of a newborn baby and using only genetic material, let's say you have a thousand such babies, if you, if you using only genetic material, you can make predictions about the mental ability of those children at age 16. Now, you can't make very good predictions yet. Uh, we're in very early days in all this. But the potential this has over the next couple of decades to transform our ability to answer all kinds of questions in the social sciences is, is really something. Because social scientists have always been struggling with this. Well, how do you decide what's environmental? How do you decide what's genetic? With what we call polygenic scores, which are based on exclusively the DNA, you have a score that cannot initially have been set by the environment. There's no backward causation. The environment, if you don't live in Chernobyl, the environment does not change a person's DNA. So I want to make clear to listeners that I'm not talking about using genetic material to make accurate predictions now. I am saying that it is on the road and we are within not that many years going to be able to make all sorts of judgments about genetic potential uh, very early in life. Kind of scary, also has lots of promise. And you think the promise in, in, this, in the social sciences is that you'll be able to come up with ex ante expectations and then see how changes? Yeah, well, let me give you a specific example of how this could be really useful. Um, and in fact, you can do these analyses now, not for individual children, but for large groups. Suppose you have a, a sample of 10,000 poor children uh, and you have their genetic uh, information and you, you create polygenic scores for intellectual ability. And so you can say, well, with this 10,000, here is what we would expect at age 16 when you administer the IQ test. Suppose when they get to be 16, you measure their observed IQs at that point, and they are far lower than the genetic material would have predicted. That would be a kind of dramatic proof we do not have yet saying, see, <laughs> these kids have environ been environmentally damaged in their intellectual development. That would energize the search for effective uh, interventions in ways we can scarcely imagine. Suppose, on the other hand, and I know people don't like to hear this, suppose that the realized intellectual ability of the kids when they're 16 is pretty close to what we would have expected. At that point, I think you have reason for people to say, look, uh, we've got to stop saying our social problems are the result of things that we can fix. And we've got to start saying we've got to have policies that accept the variation we have and that we, we live with that and we deal with it instead of remaining on this sort of obsessive determination to blame everything that goes wrong on bad institutions and bad policies. I think that's been very destructive. The downside, the potential downside would be then that um, once it becomes known that it's possible and it's that people could be earmarked early on on the basis of whatever their score is, that's I guess what people would think of as the danger. That was the scariest part, yeah. yeah. Let, me, let me put a, a more positive spin on that. 
one of the, to me, one of the worst mantras these days is everybody should go to college. <clears throat> college, a genuine college education calls on a very specific, quite limited skill set that some people have, most people do not. And there's, you know, we have elevated the college experience as being the path to first class citizenship. And if you just have a high school diploma, that uh, you are somehow a second class citizen. That's idiotic. Uh, it's idiotic on all sorts of levels, but it's also caused a lot of people who say, well, I got to go to college because everybody's got to go to college and the job openings are better. I'll make more money and they pile up student debt and they drop out. And all along, they have had talents that could be making them six figures a year doing things that are a lot more fun than shuffling papers in a mid-level white collar job. They could, they could be working in jobs that are now looked down upon as blue collar jobs, like long distance linesman repair, like uh, all sorts of skilled trades <laughs> where, where people do make six figures a year. And not only that, they are doing something which in terms of its day-to-day -day satisfactions, as far as I'm concerned, are a lot more satisfying than the jobs that you get by being a college graduate. So I look to a time well, let me put it this way. I, as we have better and better handles on people's different skills, um, could that be misused? Yes. Could it also be used so that education does a much better job of bringing kids to adulthood, having discovered something they love to do and having learned how to do it well? And I think the answer to that is yes, it will make that much more possible and that's a much better definition of success in education than the percentage of kids getting a BA. Yeah, I, uh, I might be an idealist with regard to that one because I do feel like the college experience offers the potential for a lot of development for anyone. And I would be, I would be inclined to have more people go through that uh, as long as resources were available. Um, that part is always in question whether, uh, whether it's useful on an individual level for someone to, to pay for it and then on a societal level. But putting that question aside, I think it's, it's a, a valuable experience for everyone to go through to realize their their potential i also think in the u.s i, I also think in the u.s i do feel i do feel like in the u.s one thing that college does um is there are a lot of people that have suboptimal schooling environments in in middle school and high school and college we have the best college system in the world and I think there are a lot of people that if they didn't have the opportunity in college, they might have always questioned, well, wasn't I held back by this high school I went to where none of the teachers cared and it was a terrible environment and learning was shunned. I, I think there are a lot of people that have the opportunity to shine for the first time in college, whether or not they do it is another matter, but it, for a lot of people, I think is their first opportunity to, to really shine, to either do it or not, because their high school and, and middle school was lacking in some way. Um, so the way that we do it in the U S it's societally very costly because we do have those four years for such a large percentage of the population. But um, I think you're giving kids and young adults a lot of opportunities. Okay. Of opportunities. I, I, I guess you're raising empirical questions that have, have empirical answers and, and we aren't going to settle it in the course of this conversation, but, but let me just suggest this to you. Are there kids who are suited with their skill set to go to college who don't get to college because of their environmental disadvantages? Absolutely. Should we do our very best to identify those kids and to make sure that they get all the 
chance to fulfill their potential that's out there. Yes, absolutely. What we are doing now is kind of the opposite of that. We are assuming that everybody potentially could be that. Uh, we are, we're making the blank slate assumption that, that uh, all we need is the right situation and they can blossom. And what we need to do is a much better job of identifying their strengths, whatever they may be. Because I, I submit to you, Brandon, you have an awful lot of kids who will tell you they are in college for one of a couple of reasons. Number one, mom and dad are paying for it. They expect me to go, so I'm going. But I don't really have much interest in going. And a lot of other kids are going because they've been told, unless you go to college, you'll be in a dead-end job. But they will say to you, they don't enjoy this. This is not the things that go into a college education are not their passion, not something that they enjoy doing. And there are other things that they do enjoy doing. And so I want to build on each kid's strengths. I'm just saying to you, boy, are there a lot of different configurations of skill sets out there. And we can do a much better job than we have done in the past of, of uh, getting kids into the right situation. So, um with regard to uh, sex differences, which is one of the major topics of the book, you um, you talk a bit about personality characteristics, and you note that personality characteristics on the whole uh, fit some gender stereotypes, and in, in, and um, then you talk about uh, talents and an academic achievement. And you note that talent seems to be over most of the distribution, the same for men and women, roughly the same. And, um, and achievement tends to be higher for females based on probably personality characteristics that fit better in in the in the classroom environment um and then you you know that there are some strange things that happen at the tail end of the distributions and you were able to find data on um data that i haven't seen before so i'm, I'm sure it was probably somewhat hard to uh come up with but some of the data from the duke uh, talent program where they test in the seventh grade and you're able to see um, how kids have done there and how they do subsequently. And one of the problems with IQ tests generally is that you're trying to administer a test for the whole population, but you're trying to, ideally you would want a test that was able to distinguish the top one percentile and 0.1 percentile and 0.01 percentile, but the, the tests, tests have a hard time doing, doing that, that when they're designed to separate the entire distribution. It's hard to come up with one hard enough as to, to seg segment that, but the, the Duke program, because you're having seventh graders take the SAT, uh, it's sufficiently challenging that you're able to, to segment in a way. And, uh, what, and what you find is that as expected for most of the distribution, it's, um, it's the same, although there are some, some, uh, relative strengths on the verbal side for women and some relative strengths on the math side for men. And, and then um, at the very tail end scores, for instance, like a near perfect SAT, SAT in the seventh grade on the, on the math, yeah. you, you, you would have uh, over representation for, for males. Um, and um were are you were you able to uh, say is that coming from the fact that um, it's that the male genotype is is well, well let me let me it? just tell you what the state of knowledge is about this, and I want to emphasize it's changing, uh, but 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 here are some things that are very relevant to it. Most people, when they think about testosterone, 
think about it as a drug, you know, going through the system and, and affecting all sorts of different emotions and so forth. And testosterone does have that effect, but what people usually don't realize is that the male in utero has testosterone surges at two specific times uh, during uh, pregnancy and another surge within a month or two after being born. And these surges of testosterone bond with brain neurons. It's not just simply uh, like a drug. They actually change the structure of the neurons and, and change their function. And that's in the direction of lateralization of one hemisphere of the brain. And summarizing a complex situation very quickly, neuroscientists now are, specialists in the field are pretty close to a consensus that Male brains are optimized for communication within the hemispheres, the two hemispheres, and female brains are optimized for communication between the hemispheres. Now, that has upsides and downsides for each sex. And uh, the upside for males is that the, the right hemisphere is very specialized and very efficient, and the right hemisphere is efficient in ways and uh, focused in ways that that plausibly relate to the male advantage in visual spatial skills. And visual spatial skills in turn are related to the extreme levels of mathematical skills. But you can be pretty good in math if you use uh, sort of your verbal logic to solve math problems, but you get the pure mathematicians, and I suspect you, Brandon, based on your biography, you're using visual spatial skills as well. You're thinking in you're thinking in three dimensions about a lot of mathematical issues, whereas a guy like me is thinking linearly. Well, that's the advantage for males. On the other hand, you have for women with a greater, more efficient communication between hemispheres, you have a couple of things going on. One is you're a whole lot better off if you have a brain injury if you're a woman than if you're a man. I mean, if you, if you uh, are a man and you have an injury to your left hemisphere, you lose language function and you never get it back. Uh, if you are a woman and have the, the identical injury, you'll be back to virtually normal verbal skills uh, in a matter of months because the two hemispheres can share the duties. Also, there is a fascinating thing about women at the very highest levels of ability. You were talking about the Duke program. There's a, there's a wonderful subset that I analyze it. No, I don't analyze, I report the analysis that others have done at some length about women in the top 10th of the top percentile. Here's the difference between the males and the females. The females are, are smart enough to go into any field they want to. They could go into physics, they could go into mathematics, no problem. But there are also very, very high in verbal skills. So if they want to be attorneys, they can be attorneys. If they want to go into management, they can go into management and be extremely successful there as well. With guys who are at the very top levels of mathematics ability, they typically do not have nearly the same verbal ability. So to some degree, the disproportion of men who of extreme talent who go into STEM fields versus women of equivalent talent is that women are more likely to have a choice than the guys are. It's, uh, there are all sorts of, I had a good time doing the, the section on sex differences because it was so clearly a case of different profiles as opposed to superior and inferior profiles. And I, everybody would be such, so much happier if they accepted that. You wrote the book Coming Apart to, to segment into um, what's called class in the, in the human university book. Um, you wrote coming apart, which I think maybe had the opposite media reaction as to what you're explaining. Human university yeah. it actually had quite a, quite a splash. And I imagine, yeah. uh, sold quite a number of copies and made a lot of top 10 lists and was a, a tremendously well received. Um, and was, was quite uh, innovative in a lot of ways. You had, um, if I recall, in terms of the data, you had some zip, zip code by zip code data that 
hadn't been generally utilized. You were able to get, for instance, zip code by zip code in Manhattan, stuff like education, attainment, income, marital status, yep. incarceration cool. rate, whatever, whatever you might want. Um, and you were able to do that for zip codes all over the United States. And you had, um, you had a, a narrative construction also that allowed you to uh, look at the two extremes of the segmentation from um, what might be thought of as like the Manhattan versus the uh, Belmont, Delta, Belmont, Belmont and Fishtown. Uh, Belmont and Fishtown. Um, so uh, that was written at a time where it might have resonated, especially sort of in the depths of the crisis. Um, what um, what do you think has has changed since since then? Since you wrote that book with regard to to class. Well, uh, there was a, the subtitle of Coming Apart was The State of White America from 1960 to 2010. So I focused my data exclusively on whites. Actually, I did it for a, an expedient reason that uh, I wanted my readers to understand that a lot of the problems I was talking about were not the function of uh, uh, minorities or anything else. This was true of plain vanilla non-Latino whites. It turned out serendipitously, I didn't plan it, that things were going on with whites that I was able to capture that a lot of people hadn't realized. And that was, one of them was the degree to which you had a lot of growing hostility, which is to say, whites, ordinary whites were aware that white elites were looking down on them, condescending to them, uh, despising them in many cases, uh, so that the people in Silicon Valley look upon uh, uh, people in uh, Idaho or uh, Alabama or so forth as not just kind of stupid, but as just not interesting human beings. And that kind of condescension is reflected in phrases like flyover country. Uh, it's reflected in the fact that there is still one ethnic slur you can use and get away with, namely redneck. You can't use any other ethnic slur and get away with it. You can redneck. Well, that was all true when I was writing Coming Apart, which was published in 2012. And it was a few years later, the depth of that anger among a lot of ordinary white Americans toward the elites became apparent with the 2016 election. And if you want to explain why Donald Trump became president of the United States, I think it's that class polarization uh, that I was describing in uh, Coming Apart. And what's happened since then? It's gotten worse. So that when I, when I did uh, Coming Apart, I didn't have access to the 2010 census data yet, because it takes a while for those things to get out. So I was using 2000 census data. And I've been able to update what's happened with the zip code since then. And, and everything has just intensified. So basically, you have four clusters. You have the Washington, D.C. area, New York City area, San Francisco slash Silicon Valley, and uh, Los Angeles area, where the people who run the country live, basically. If you talk about the people who run the institutions that, that uh, shape the nation's culture and economics and politics, they live in those four areas. And each of those four areas is far more concentrated, even than it was in 2000, in very affluent zip codes, very highly educated zip codes. And it's not just one zip code. It's contiguous zip codes that are in this stratospherically high level. That's the difference between a place like Miami, for example, where you are, right? And, uh, and Washington, D.C., Miami has some really rich zip codes, but they are surrounded by zip codes that are more varied. varied. And uh, if you go to Washington, D.C., and you go to the zip codes where the movers and shakers in Washington, D.C. live, these zip codes aren't in the top five percentiles in terms of their socioeconomic wealth and education. They aren't even within the top one percentile. They are in the top one-tenth of the top percentile, and, and they are contiguous with each other. And then they are surrounded by zip codes that are in the top 1%. So you have a million people 
in the DC area now living in continuous zip codes that are all in the top five percentiles or higher. And you have similar things in the New York City area, San Francisco and Los Angeles. So you got people living in different worlds. The guys living in that part of Washington DC and the guys living in Tulsa, Oklahoma are living in different cultures with different assumptions. And the one thing that binds them is the contempt that the elites have in Washington for the people in Tulsa and the anger that the people in Tulsa have for the people in uh, the elites. And I picked on those two examples, but it generalizes that we see it in our politics playing out all the time. And at the time you wrote Coming Apart, the differences were uh, economic, but you also spoke a lot of cultural differences cultural difference, and, yeah. a lot of, and a lot of the a lot of the conflict was driven by cultural differences. In the way I see it, um, Trump did exploit those cultural differences and he, he won the election, but then he sort of set about making the economic differences more extreme in the, in the way that he <laughs> handheld the financial sector and other, other ways he coddled, uh, coddled the uh, financialization of, of, of and, and the way we, that we run our economy, he, he made the differences, the economic differences more distinct in a lot of ways, I would say. Um, Causally, I'm not sure how, whether you can make that case, but uh, I think that in perceptions of people, that's, that's certainly uh, a common perception. I, I, I don't think, well, I don't want to get into talking. Yeah, about and, and, and culturally, um, you talk a lot about the, the impact of uh, our higher education system and how it creates a, a tendency where you've got quite distinct sets. So maybe at Stanford, you've got uh, top 1% intelligence and uh, certain schooling and uh, they are having kids together, getting married, and there's there's not as much yeah. uh, moving in back and forth between your Belmont and Fishtown, and and that creates uh, its own its own dynamics over the long term. Uh, yeah, and so even you know, they are they aren't getting married in college or even graduate school in lots of cases. But who do they marry finally? Well, uh, you, you know, it's the it's the MBA from Harvard Business School getting married to the Yale Law uh, School graduate. Uh, uh, what they meet when when the, the 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 woman attorney is litigating a case for the for the male uh, uh, business school graduate. Yeah, the the assortative mating is the technical term for it. And you were around Harvard, and you knew the couples there. How many how many did you know where both people in the couple were really, really smart and really, really highly educated. And in a lot of cases, if they were in business, uh, were both pulling, or, or the law, were both pulling down really good incomes. That's, that's intensified as well. And as far as the culture being different, you were at Harvard and you were at Florida. Is it fair to say that uh, the student body culture at Florida was a whole lot different from the student body culture at Harvard? Yeah, yeah, it was it was a lot different. Um, it was less academic, more life. Right at Florida, it just felt like people were living life and doing normal things, and not not academic. Unfortunately. Well, yeah, but the nice thing too about a place like Florida is that you have plenty of really smart kids at Florida, and I'm sure that you found uh, a peer group that, that intellectually, in terms of your academics, was met your needs. But also you were around a bunch of, a lot of other kids who were not in this rarefied, super intellectual frame of mind. I'm saying the same thing you're saying, except I'm a little more positive about it. <laughs> I think it was very healthy for you that you were around more kids who... Uh, yeah, it was good socialization. And I have the uh, issue with my own kids where my uh, 
girl goes to a school that's very well suited for her, but my, my boy maybe would be better suited for a public school where he would have the experience of, uh, having kids that are, that are socializing him on the playgrounds. He might, might benefit from that. But, uh, yep. I, uh, I think my, my wife and I moved to Burkittsville, Maryland back in 1989, partly because I wanted my kids not to be in the rarefied atmosphere of the private schools in Washington, D.C. Uh, I, I tell when I'm speaking to audiences that are filled with the elites that I'm talking about, I like to tell them they're wasting an awful lot of their money on private schools because it's not making their kids any smarter than they would have been otherwise. Uh, and in a lot of cases, they're making, it's making their kids into hothouse flowers who don't know how to cope with the real world. Yeah, and I, I notice um, there are certain kids, especially boys that benefit from the socialization that happens. Uh, with myself, I, I was went to public schools and I can remember a, a lot of your behavioral development comes, say in the middle school years where the, the older boys are, are quite difficult. Uh, I, I think some boys go, they benefit from going through that, that sort of socialization. But these are questions that I'm sure I'll have much more to say as I watch my own, my own son go through things. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time. I know I took a little bit more than, uh, than no, anticipated, I, 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 really, uh, I really appreciate it. Brandon, it's been my pleasure.